All right. Well, we're going to get get rolling. Uh, we, uh, David Bornstein left uh, laid such a wonderful foundation for understanding what social entrepreneurship is all about and what its importance is going to be in this next century. And uh, now we are going to hear from some real live social entrepreneurs who are doing some very exciting work. Uh, out there, and to lead us through this discussion, we're so pleased that Jack Myers, the president of the uh, Rockefeller Archive Center, has, uh, is with us. Uh, you can read about his bio. He didn't want me to say anything about him, you, but you can read about his bio in the book, but I'll just say briefly that in addition to being president, he also lectures at the Yale School of Management and teaches uh, about, about philanthropic uh, foundations and um, and lectures on all kinds of related uh, related nonprofit subjects. So uh, he's held many positions, at, uh, including being uh, the deputy director of the Getty Foundation and uh, an assistant director of the National Endowment for uh, Humanities. Uh, and he received his degree from another Rockefeller-created institution, the University of Chicago. So without further ado, Jack Myers. Thank you, Christy. Um, the, uh, the theme of our panel today, as Christy mentioned, is, uh, is breaking the mold. And we're going to hear from uh, several of uh, philanthropy's new entrepreneurs, uh, the kinds of people David was just talking about. Uh, as someone from an archive uh, that holds the records of, of so many American philanthropic organizations, I can't help but notice that people have been breaking molds in American philanthropy for a long time uh, in the United States. Um, many philanthropists, but I, I, I should note that many philanthropists particularly in the early years of organized philanthropy in the US, never set out to break a mold. They were just trying to solve problems. Uh, when John D. Rockefeller Sr., uh, Jr., and their philanthropic advisor, Frederick Gates, uh, created the General Education Board that Peter and Jim talked about yesterday back in 1902, they were setting out to solve a problem, you know, poor, edu the education, uh, poor education in the South. Uh, they adopted the model of the philanthropic foundation that had been pioneered uh, by the Peabody Education Fund back in 1867. But they then broke the mold and created the first large professionally staffed foundation in the United States that set out not to do direct charity, but to try to find the root causes of the problems it was engaged with. Uh, what Frederick Gates used to call in this wonderful phrase, wholesale rather than retail philanthropy. Um, but even back in, in, in 1902, you didn't need to be a rich philanthropist uh, to engage in a new form of philanthropy. Um, in that same year, a Methodist minister named Edgar Helms, uh, a man whose name has so dropped from history he doesn't even have a Wikipedia entry, I see. Um, he's, uh, he, he faced a different kind of problem, uh, an immediate problem. Uh, Helms was the minister of a very poor congregation in South Boston. And his church needed repairs that his congregation couldn't afford. And a member of his congregation suggested to Helms that he might try to collect used clothing, and uh, the congregation members could repair the clothing, and, and, and they could, that it could then be sold. Well, the sale went so well um, that Helms realized that he could help also alleviate the poverty uh, of his poorest church members by paying them uh, to repair the clothes and using the income to subsidize their wages. Uh, now, with images of the workhouses of uh, Victorian England weren't far in the past at this point, so Helms was really careful to create a pretty respectful environment to pay a, uh, certainly a fair wage. And um, by 1905, Helms had opened a, a formal store for the repaired clothing and incorporated the effort into an organization named after his chapel, the Morgan Memorial. And in 1915, when two Methodist ministers came to Boston to organize a branch of their Bro Brooklyn mission to the poor, uh, they decided to join forces with Helms. They really liked his idea. And, they, um, they, and Helms decided it would be a good idea to take the name of this Brooklyn mission, which he liked a lot. It was called the Goodwill Mission. And they founded uh, Goodwill Industries. Uh, so in, in, in 1902, two very different kind of mold-breaking ideas um, started organizations that would have a huge effect on Americans' lives. Uh, John D. Rockefeller certainly never imagined that he would, was starting to create a model that would spawn major philanthropic foundations in the United States. And Helms would never imagine that um, Goodwill Industries as a whole would someday have an income of almost $2 billion and would become a model uh, for this kind of social entrepreneurship in the United States. 
Um, well, the new philanthropists you're going to hear from today are also working on specific issues. Uh, but in the process, I, I think they too may be creating new types of philanthropy that may in turn become a model for succeeding generations. I think only time will tell us that, but I, I think you'll find their, um, their immediate stories to be, to be really fascinating and uh, I hope even a little inspiring. Um, David is joining us for the panel, but I'd like to begin by asking our new panelists uh, to say a little bit about their organization organizations and tell us briefly uh, about their missions and programs. I'm really going to uh, skip the intros because of in, in uh, uh, thinking about our time. So I, you've got their bios in, in the book. Let me just say it will start with Woody Tosh, uh, the founder and chairman of Slow Money. Difficult assignment um, at this stage in the proceedings. My head is spinning. I'm sure all of yours uh, are spinning too. So um, I'm going to say a few minutes. just. Chop me off here whenever we got to get to the next panel, and hopefully I'll stick around for lunch. We can have a few of us can talk some more. So first thing I'm going to do is just say, fast money, philanthropy. Picture two circles. Now bring the circles together. Where they start overlapping is slow money. Ways of putting our money to work, which are I, I think David used the word agnostic about silos and, and uh, ways to put our money to work, which is return agnostic. In other words, we're not sure how much money we're going to make. We want to make some money. We want to put the money into for-profit social enterprises. That's another key component. I consider a farm to be one of the epitome of a small for-profit social enterprise. Right? It may not make much money, but it is not a nonprofit. It's someone's trying to make a living, producing something and selling it. Where's the money going to come from? If we want to rebuild, I'm just now I'm, I'm jumping around really fast here just to give you a feel. Where if we want to have a million new small farmers in the United States in the next 10 or 20 years. I'm not sure if anybody in the room really agrees with that or not. But if you, how many people would like to see that in this country? So not everybody, but maybe a third of the people in the room. Um, for resilience, I'm, I'm trying to pick up on, you touched on so many great things in your talk, that's why my head is spinning. You talked about resilience, and I would say resilience is not the same thing as a technological fix for a problem. Right? More technology does not necessarily make us more resilient. Technology is needed. Um, Faster, more complicated global financial markets do not make us more resilient, necessarily. They can't be relied on completely to make us more resilient. So I think that the theme of slow money is maybe twofold. I've never put it quite this way. Uh, we need to take a chunk of our money and invest it for diversity as opposed to efficiency. We need to balance. We need more small, decentralized, healthy units of every kind. In our case, we're interested in food production, so we're talking about farms and, and local food systems. But I think the same thing could be said of energy, the same thing could be said of finance, global versus local. And where's the capital going to come to do this? Uh, it's not going to come top down. It's got to come bottom up. It's got to come from all of us taking a little of our money and putting it to work in a new way. Um, you talked about agency at the very end of your, of your remarks, David, and so to me, uh, I, I feel that, that we're trying to address one of, uh, certainly what I think is one of the most um, pressing problems of lack of agency going on anywhere, and that is that we as investors, whether you have a lot of money or little money, are giving our money to people we don't know very well to invest in things they don't fully understand halfway around the world in places they will never visit, or we will never visit. <laughs> How many people think that's a recipe for, for a resilient future? I'm serious. And does anybody actually think that's... Anybody think that's, no, good, no one's raising your hand. So what are we going to do about it? It's easy to say what the problem is. It's hard to figure out, so what are we going to do about it? Well, in our case, uh, we're doing a little something about it. We'll see if it scales. We are organizing networks of individuals at all places of the economic continuum, from the richest of the rich to the just average person who might only have 50 bucks to put to work. And uh, which, and as you all know, that's pretty complicated, what I just said. If you're going to get all those people together to actually move some money, there are all kinds of issues that come up. But we are doing it. I don't have time to tell you all the how of we're doing it. I'm just going to give you a brush stroke. We've been at it for a couple of years. Um, it, it was prompted by this book. Um, I wish I had time to read a page, but I'm not going to. Um, but all I'll, I'll tell you is uh, it has sparked a conversation. Now, the conversation only has a few thousand people in it so far. Depending on how you count, a few thousand people are actively engaged, and a few tens of thousands of people are kind of around that little kernel of 2,000 people. Um, we've invested about 17, over $17 million in over 100 small food enterprises around the United States in the last two years, just to give you some idea that some action is actually happening. There are 14 local chapters, probably be 20 by the end of the year. There are five local investment clubs. 
not the same thing as a chapter, a whole other thing, people committing $5,000 a piece into an LLC to put money to work. And you could call it microloans, but they're a little bigger than microloans. You're talking about maybe 5,000. Well, if there's any bankers in the room, you'll consider that a microloan. So, uh, but not a microloan like a Kiva microloan, more a little bit scaled up to fit the US market. So there's a lot of little activities um, coming out of this. And it's really sparked by, by this uh, conversation about agency. I want to go back to agency. It's a bunch of us saying, if we want to see, and you fill in the blank, just fill in the blank, what is it you'd like to see 25 years from now? And I'll just say, I'd like to see lots of healthier local communities, um, more diversity in the food system, more diversity in the economy. I'm talking about uh, not just diversification, but cultural and biological diversity. Right? If we want to see that, all of our money can't be streaming up smokestacks in China and going into huge financial institutions and then hoping we're going to take back the dregs of it and kind of clean up the mess. Uh, I just don't think that's going to get the job done in the 21st century. So we are, um, again, to come back make it a little more concrete, we're hoping to have a million people taking 1% of their money and putting it to work in local food systems within a decade. Some people think that's preposterously ambitious. Some people think it's pathetically paltry. Um, <laughs> therefore, it must be just right. <laughs> um, and uh, laughter is good because money is a daunting subject. And, 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 and oh, so Christy talked about convening and catalyzing. And actually, that's what we're doing in our own little way. We, are, we actually bring people together. We've had three national gatherings. Um, uh, the last one, we had 850 people from 36 states and several foreign countries. Um, and they're just coming together to have this conversation around a whole bunch of ideas that would spin out from what I just shared with you. And then we, we have, uh, at each one of our gatherings, actual small food entrepreneurs who are pitching for money. Uh, now, if you, if you take those two circles that I posited at the beginning and you begin to push them together, someone will say, well, are you only doing for-profit? And the answer is, like 95% of what we're doing is putting money into for-profits, but we actually, some philanthropy also Old good old fashioned philanthropy grants also happens because not every single thing that we want to do to rebuild local food systems is ready for a for profit for a loan or an equity investment. Most of these are very small loans. If, if the financial people in the room are saying, how the hell are you doing this? Most of them are very small direct loans from, between individuals, groups of individuals and an individual enterprise. What else can I tell you? Um, is, is that enough just to kind of get my... I'm, tr I'm, I'm trying to be cognizant of the time, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to we talk about it. We have a lot more, more to talk about. Okay. Uh, now I'd like to uh, turn to Pamela Crane, uh, who's currently working in Rwanda uh, as the African field manager for an organization called Blood Water Mission. Pamela. Thank you. I'd love to start out today by just talking a little bit about history. I feel like in, over the last 24 hours, we've heard a lot about legacy, about the Rockefeller Foundation, about how the parents taught the children about how the children are now trying to go forward with maybe less than what they had, but also making good decisions. We've heard about the differences between charity and philanthropy, and I would add to that between charity and development. Um, and we've also heard the experience, we've experienced, I would say, the power of story. And I think story can change lives. Um, and so I wanna tell you a little piece of my story and how that interweaves with the organization that I work for. I was born in Kenya um, 31 years ago. So a little while ago, I was one of two white babies in the hospital. The other was a boy, so I know who my parents are. There's no <laughs> questions there. Um, when I returned to work in Africa at the age of 22, um, I started working doing research in West Africa. And I started in the village, and they called me the Oimbo, which means white person. And not much later, they decided that I was a good person because I came back when I said I would come back. And also because I loved the children. And a little bit later, now, now as I work in East Africa and Central Africa, people will say that I have a black heart, but white skin. <laughs> and, and so, and so that's, my, that's my legacy and my heritage. I watched my parents, because not only was I born in Kenya, I left when I was a year old. But then I was raised in the Middle East and South Pacific because my parents were Peace Corps volunteers. And then my father worked with USAID and just retired last year. And so that was my legacy, and that's something that I was born into and decided at a very young age, just like David mentioned, that this was, this was what I wanted to do. I didn't know how I wanted to do it, but I knew that this was something I loved. I knew that I loved refugees. I knew that I loved making communities better. I knew that I loved walking with people and hearing their stories and engaging with them. And so that's what I do. Um, I work with an organization called Bloodwater Mission. It's an interesting name here and in Africa to try and explain. HIV, AIDS, and water. That's our mission, that's what we work with. Um, is, it, is it ideal? 
In some ways, I'd say no, because I love holistic community development. But where it becomes ideal is the fact that we partner with organizations in Africa, small grassroots nonprofits, who do holistic development, and we engage with them in specific sectors. We engage with them in HIV AIDS and with water. And we find the best solutions with them for the communities in which they work. I don't believe in solutions that are universal. There aren't solutions that are universal. But there are community solutions that can work in very, very specific situations. I also believe that there are often underlying problems to, to, to everything. So somebody doesn't have water in northern Uganda. Why don't they have water in that village? Well, the LRA was there for 10 to 20 years. The LRA destroyed their infrastructure. When somebody goes back into that community after living in a refugee camp, the issue is not just infrastructure. We can throw money at that and we can put a well up. But the issue really is hope. Do they have the hope that their lives will be different? That if they construct that well and they maintain that well, that, that they'll actually be there in five years? Or is the LRA going to come back and take it from them again? So, it, so if they don't have hope, there's no reason to change. You, you see the same sort of thing in Rwanda at times when, when you have issues with the genocide. It's no different really in America. There's underlying issues behind everything. Some places it's hope. Some is, there, there's all sorts of different reasons. That's just what I, you know, I'm touching on there. So, so we, in all of our work, we look not only at, at the infrastructure issue, that, that issue of health clinics, or of water or of sanitation, but we look at those underlying things, believing that if you, tr if you transform a person in who they are, they'll begin to solve their own problems, and there'll be self-replication, which it gets into this idea of entrepreneurship. What, how will they begin to change themselves and make themselves better? One of the things I love about the organization that I work for is that we really believe we have a dual mission. We work in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and, and that's where I work. I, I live in Rwanda, and that's the work that I do, and as well as we work in five countries. But on the US side, we believe that we need to change the American mind. Um, it, the, the mind needs to be changed so that we don't just have philanthropists who, are, who, are, who have lots of money, but that the average person with the average dollar can make a difference. So Blood Water Mission really started with a campaign that one dollar equals water for one African for one year. Look at your wallet and think about what that means. Um, and so when you begin to, to engage with somebody that they can make a difference at that level, their whole minds change. If we do this at the age of 15 years old or, or younger, think about what happens as those people grow up and their children are changed. So one of the campaigns we have going on this summer, is, it's called Lemonade, Lemon Colonade. All of our stuff have colons in it. Um, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a world of marketing today. That's our thing, we have colons. But, but the idea is, is that little kids can raise money at Lemonade stands and, and they can share the stories of little kids in Africa who need water and so that that lemon aid stand can make a tangible difference somewhere else. And so we do things like that. We have fantastic stories. One of my favorite ones is a homeless shelter in Texas. Um, this homeless shelter decided that they could make a difference. And so at the beginning of their meals, they had a jar out, and somebody in the community said that for every, every dollar, every penny that they gave, they would match that. And this, and this homeless shelter put their quarters and their dimes and their pennies in that jar for a month. And then we had a team that was riding across country on bicycles, stopping at communities along the way, telling stories about Africa, about HIV AIDS and water, and about how people can make a difference. And so this bicycle team, biking, not, motor, not motorcycles, biking in the heat of the summer through Texas, pulled into the homeless shelter because the homeless shelter was gonna house them that night. And they said they didn't have a lot to give, but they were gonna make up the beds and they were gonna wash the bikes because they wanted the bikes to be clean. And then they gave them the money and the person in the community matched that money. And, and in, in that moment, you can think about all of the lives that were transformed. In that evening, the bikers, the homeless shelters, and then people in Africa were changed. And so it, with that, I, I, I think about how we're beginning to change the story in America, how we're beginning to engage and change the story of young people, just as we're changing things in Africa. Um, is, is this done perfectly? I, I don't know that it is. I, I'd like to say that we do a really good job at it. One of the things that I, um, David mentions that there's a lot of organizations out there not doing good work. And I, and I, would, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, and, and so I wanted to, I was talking with one of my partners literally this week, and I was saying I was coming here to talk to philanthropists. And, and this is what he said. He said, Bloodwater Mission does things radically, it's a radi working with them is a radically different experience. You don't pull punches. You allow us to speak from the realities of the field. You ask how to best build our partnerships and how to make our program stronger. And he, basically he said, you listen. Um, and, and that's one thing, you know, just to toss out a question for, for us maybe in the future is to say, you know, what, what is philanthropy or what is social entrepreneurship really about? Is it, is it about um, on the ground and who is it really for? Is it making us feel better? 
or is it really changing the systems and making a long-term difference? So. Thanks, Ben. Um, uh, Mark Hannis uh, is the co-founder and, and a board member of uh, United and, and Genocide. Which <laughs> Uplifting subject matter uh, before lunch. Um, so I think it would be helpful, I'll just give my, my brief background about and, and what we're doing. So four of my grandparents are Holocaust survivors. Um, my mother's parents fled to uh, Scotland on the kinder transport. Um, so my mom's got the great Scottish accent, so I can do all the lines from Braveheart. <laughs> um, and my father's parents were in the concentration camps and uh, tried to get refuge in the US but were denied, Cuba denied, and made their way to Ecuador in South America. Uh, so they met there and uh, uh, had a son, my dad. Uh, I was born and raised there. My parents met in Los Angeles, go figure. Um, and they raised a family in Ecuador. So I grew up for 18 years uh, in Ecuador, in the capital. Uh, belonged to a small Jewish community of 100 families. And everyone was a survivor or descendants of survivors. So every time I'd go to services, uh, a lot of the elders had the numbers tattooed on their arms and would always remind everyone uh, especially the younger generations of the two critical lessons. Never forget, never forget how six million Jews and five million others were systematically targeted. And two, and as equally as important, never let it happen again. Doesn't matter if you're Jewish, Scottish, Ecuadorian, American, never allow people to be targeted for who they are. Uh, but thanks to uh, philanthropists, I was able to get close to a full scholarship to come to the United States. Um, so I went to Swarthmore College outside of Philadelphia. And uh, my senior year, I was uh, reading the newspaper. Uh, it was March Madness. I was looking at my pics. And there was an article about what was happening in Darfur. And uh, it was called the first genocide of the 21st century. Um, first time ever the United States government has declared an ongoing crisis of genocide. We've always either been too late or tried to avoid it, as in the case of Rwanda. And this shocked me. Uh, and given I was primed, I knew I had to do something about it. I needed agency. As a, as a student in the United States. And so I didn't allow my schooling to interfere with my education, uh, so I skipped class <laughs> and uh, went, went to the library um, and went to the source of all information, Google and Wikipedia, and started to learn more what was happening. And uh, as, we, as my classmates and I started developing, get, getting a better understanding of what was happening, we came up with what David said, we were agnostic about the sectors. So we decided, why not hit all three? at the same time. So we created a very strategic, uh, impact-driven approach to engaging the three sectors. So engaging average Americans, what we decided to do is raise money instead of for goats, as heifer is great, or a child or a village, we decided to raise money for protection. Um, we knew that it was American forces that liberated the Jews and others in the concentration camps, that peacekeepers were the ones on the front line uh, in, in Darfur, and there are many Rwandans, uh, soldiers who didn't have the funding to go to Darfur, uh, but they were willing to go do that, and we said we could raise that money. So we got on Facebook and asked all of our friends and asked all of their friends, raise money to adopt a peacekeeper. Uh, in 100 days, we raised a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, so we were able to fund two patrols to accompany girls and women who had to leave their camps to collect firewood, to uh, collect their food, and were often facing gang rape uh, when they were collecting the, the firewood. Then we started to look at the role of the private sector in markets, because we knew, as David said, that they drive a lot of decision making. And in most areas of conflict, uh, the, the private sector is either complicit in providing the revenue to purchase the guns, the, the bombs, the missiles, uh, or, they're com or they're complacent in not using their leverage. And we knew American businesses and investors had a lot of uh, stocks and investments in some of these companies in areas of conflict. So we decided, as students, to go after the, the low-hanging fruits and went after college endowments and started asking them if they look at their endowments and how they're invested, not just in uh, you know, environmental impact or big tobacco or labor impact. We want them to also look at human rights impact. Uh, so we studied a lot of other models and created our own model uh, on how to invest effectively while reducing conflict risk and got Harvard University to pass the largest private endowments uh, to look at $4.4 .4 million of stock in there and some of these companies uh, that they invested in. So we spread that model to 60 other colleges and universities. And once we got all the universities in California, UC Davis, Santa Barbara, San Diego, uh, to pass that, we then started to write state legislation because we knew pension systems had way more money than endowments. Uh, CalSTRS and CalPERS 
uh, largest private, uh, largest pension systems. And we, uh, after a while, lobbied Governor Schwarzenegger uh, to ensure that CalSTRS and CalPERS use our model. So now we have over $3 trillion of assets that now use conflicts uh, as, a, as a criteria uh, when they invest in areas around the world. Uh, and have had 12 companies shift their behavior uh, in about two years, which took that same number of companies took over two decades when Americans were lobbying companies against apartheid South Africa. So we still go quicker, faster, deeper. And the last part um, is how to get political. And that's what I mentioned Governor Schwarzenegger, and I think hopefully the next phase of philanthropy is, and what's so amazing with Winthrop Rockefeller is that he went beyond philanthropists and he got skin in the game in terms of politics because we've got way more leverage using uh, our governments, local, state, federal. So what we decided to do is there's no, no matter how much money we could raise on our own, we could never stop genocide or prevent it without engaging policymakers. So we decided, we met with the NRA and folks on the family and Move On and Sierra Club and all these other political groups and asked them how did they do it on their issue and how we could adopt it for human rights. So we're creating the first permanent anti-genocide political constituency and we create tools uh, to help people get political about it. So we created a report card grading every member of Congress on how they vote and co-sponsor, make it publicly available for anyone to shame their member of Congress, which happens by getting a D minus or a B minus, where literally people are emailing, calling their members, and they're calling us back saying, please get people to stop emailing me. What can I do to get a better grade? <laughs> um, or we had, a, we had a bunch of students calling one member of Congress, and he said, I just co-sponsored this bill. Can you update my grade from a D minus to B minus so I can tell my constituents I'm passing. We then got a little more innovative and to get it even easier, and we created a tool that all of you have on you or within a foot of you at every moment, and that is your phones. So we created the anti-genocide hotline called 1-800-GENOCIDE. Whenever you call the phone number 1-800-GENOCIDE, all you have to do is enter your five-digit zip code, and our system will identify your specific representative, your two senators, or give you the option to call the White House. Whatever option you pick on your phone, we will give you the specific action items that that policymaker needs to take and then connect you for free so you as a constituent can tell them what they need to do. And we've had over, over 60,000 calls and uh, over 60 representatives have gone from failing to passing grades, 30 senators from failing to passing grades. So this to us, 1-800-GENOCIDE. Uh, so it's, we call it stopping genocide could be as easy as ordering pizza. Um, so, so this to us is, is sort of the next field, is how to leverage this. And we, uh, you know, the Gates Foundation, biggest foundation, gives $4 billion a year uh, to address a lot of issues, especially in public health internationally. Our foreign aid budget is $50 billion a year. So there's a, a lot more leverage there, and it's always being cut because most Americans think we only give, we give 25% of our taxes internationally when we give less than 1%. So every cycle we're always battling uh, to have to, to keep foreign aid spending uh, to do amazing projects there. So the last thing is just a story that ties into Rwanda and others is uh, what I, I love telling is the story of Terry Schiavo, you know, the woman in Florida with a feeding tube. You know, whatever side you were on, Americans around the country got mobilized on this issue for this one woman in Florida that they, they, got, on their, they got an email, they called their members of Congress and asking for a response. And Congress held special sessions past midnight, they're pulling all-nighters, they're meeting on weekends, Congress hates to meet on weekends, to write a piece of legislation for one woman. Former President Bush was flooded with phone calls that he canceled his vacation in Texas, flew back to the Oval Office to wait uh, to sign a piece of legislation for one woman. But in all these other social injustice areas, there's way more than one person. In Rwanda, they killed close to a million people in 100 days. A million people in 100 days, that's the equivalent of two 9-11s every day for 100 days. And how many of us in this room who were alive in 1994 had TV access, it was in the news, called our members of Congress? I bet very few of us did. The only way we're gonna solve social justice <coughs> issues and hopefully philanthropists who have disposable income probably also give to pol uh, political campaigns is to tie and synchronize all of these things together to help create the necessary systems change that we want to see. Thanks. We're really short of time at this point. Um, I, I had some questions prepared, but uh, actually maybe if, if there are questions out there, why don't, why don't I, uh, I open it up to the audience? <coughs> Specific questions?
Hello, my name is Heath Carlock. I'm a recent graduate of the Clinton School of Public Service in Little Rock. My question is for David and maybe you, Mark. Um, and it involves entrepreneurship. America is at war right now in Afghanistan, and we've been at war over the last decade. But there's also been impressive entrepreneurial efforts and outfits designed in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I was wondering, could you elaborate on that? And how does war affect um, social entrepreneurs? What's the relationship there? <laughs> I, from my own experience, <clears throat> I've done quite a number of interviews with people uh, working on the ground in Afghanistan, less than, less than Iraq. Uh, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the law and order situation just makes it very uh, dangerous for people. Of, anyone who's uh, essentially challenging the status quo, which is what you're doing if you're an entrepreneur, you're trying to change the way things are, uh, faces dangers in a conflict situation like that. So what it requires is essentially people have to be very courageous to do that work, especially in Afghanistan. A lot of people working on women's rights issues there that I've interviewed um, have had members of their staff targeted. Some people have had people killed in their organizations uh, for advocating simple things like education of girl children and so forth. So it takes tremendous courage and I think it's incumbent on, um, you know, we talked about winning hearts and minds uh, a long time ago when we started this war and we talked uh, a lot of, some of the justifi justification for the initial invasion of Afghanistan was to protect women. So I think it, it would be incumbent on um, the armed forces to consider, you know, the, the role that they, that they play vis-a-vis -vis, uh, organizations that are essentially acting on that promise, not necessarily on behalf of the government, but in, certainly in line with the government's uh, objectives, uh, you know, i.e. You know, protecting people, providing them with cover and so forth. Anonymity in some cases is very important. Uh, but in a lot of cases, people just have to pick up and stop. You see that happening very often, too, because it just becomes uh, too dangerous. I'll just add, I, I, that's our thing, is uh, we need to have security, Maslow's Triangle. You need, to, you need to be able to know that you can wake up the next morning not facing a threat or your kids being attacked before you can get a lot more innovative and get capital and, and have the opportunity to, uh, to execute on your ideas. Uh, there is space in the different approaches. There's an organization, Independent Diplomat, that helps train opposition parties because when they are negotiating um, with governments, uh, sometimes they don't have the, the skills, the training on how to do diplomacy well because a lot of these conflicts require political solutions. Uh, we know about educating women, finding jobs for young men is one of the best ways to get out of uh, the conflict trap. Um, so there's a lot of organizations that help empower women, not just um, as through microfinance or um, in education, but there's also trying to make sure that women are at the negotiating table because you see more sustainable peace uh, when women are actually part of that conversation. In some of these countries, women are never at the table. Um, so there's a high likelihood that, uh, that it's not gonna be a lasting peace. So there are, there are different entrepreneurs, it's just very hard. And, and people are taking a crazy risk. And Ashoka actually has a, a section, a program, where they work really hard to protect Ashoka fellows in areas of conflicts because they know that they're taking a significant risk in putting themselves out there. So whether that's helping ensure the State Department can get them a visa out there or making sure that uh, opposition forces know that there's a higher profile, recently like this Chinese human rights dissident, it's harder for the, op for the government to go after him if they know the world is watching. And just to add one point to that, uh, there's a lot of social entrepreneurs, great organizations working in the United States to help, to help veterans when they come back because I don't know if uh, there was a really startling statistic that I saw recently that the, um, the suicide rate is something like 20 times higher than the death rate for returning veterans. And think about that. For every veteran who, for every soldier who dies in combat, 20 commit suicide. That was something that I saw written in the New York Times by Nick Kristoff a few weeks ago. Uh, a lot of organizations are trying to figure out what to do about that. How do you actually, what is a transition back to normal life that works for more people? It's, it's a big area of uh, ex experimentation now because it's not just therapy and they'll be fine. There's actually a lot of things that have to happen. Rituals that bring people back and help their whole society share the burden 
of what a soldier may have done that they feel they carry by themselves. That's, they, they actually ask their neighbors and their community members to help me carry this, this burden of, of what my experience was. Uh, those kinds of ritualistic things are very, very interesting, and some of them, some people are finding that they work quite well. Um, one, one question I, I, I'd like to ask, just um, if each, each of you could address, um, just to talk a little bit about the, the biggest challenges that your work faces. I mean, what are the, what are the biggest challenges you find, and, and what kinds of solutions have you developed to, to meet those challenges? Uh, well, what pops into my head is uh, the first time I was in public um, when the book came out, uh, uh, speaking in Burlington, Vermont, at the annual meeting of the Vermont Community Loan Fund. And uh, it was my first time out with this. I started, went into my little talk and went on for about an hour. And then we had a roaring discussion of about 50 people in the room. At the, and at the end of what had turned out to be a wonderful, very animated discussion, the guy says, well, I've been listening. And uh, I've been a banker here for 40 years. Uh, how on earth do you ever think you're going to get anybody to do this? <laughs> so you're turning the old notions of fiduciary responsibility completely on their head. And, and uh, I said something then that I was kind of hoping might be true, and now in the last couple of years I now somewhere between believe and know it's true. Um, you be the judge. Um, and that is that I, I said, well, we're not, I'm not really trying to convince anybody to do anything. There are. Well, you know, the rest of us in this room just had a really robust conversation. This conversation wants to happen, and I think there's an impulse here that we all want to try to follow, and we're going to help each other figure out how to do it. So, um, you know, that said, there are a host of fiduciary, both legal, cultural, philosophical, fear-based, knowledge-based uh, reasons that this hasn't happened yet. And then there's a whole bunch of other impulses that are going to make it happen. And uh, in terms of how I get over the hurdles, it's actually uh, not by convincing or, um, or even lo actually in our case lobbying, although there's a lot of questions about someday in the future could we affirmatively influence various tax laws and other things, but we're nowhere near that. Right now we're just actually helping one another. It's a very nurturing approach. It's just a lot of collaboration. And uh, the impulse has been strong enough that when we get people in rooms of this size who have elected to come just to do, do this, um, the energy is strong enough to carry us forward. Okay. I think for us, one of the biggest issues is that sustainable community development takes a lot of time. And, and so it, it's not about technology, it's about behavior change, and it's about transformation. Um, and so when you marry that, with, marry that with social entrepreneurship, we, we want fast results oftentimes. And people want this instant result, instant feedback loops. Um, the, the, there's a mismatch there. Um, and, and, so, and, so how, and so how do you really work with those? One, one of the things that we're coming up with is really trying to find long-term funder, funders. So people like philanthropists, foundations, um, people who can stand with us in the long term and are willing to go with us for that long-term community development and still engage people um, along the way. And it will allow us and free us to do that in a, in a much better way. I, I think that's sort of a conflict. And so people who are really selling community development or community transformation internationally in, in developing nations, but saying that they're going to have instant results, it, they're just not telling the full story. And, and that makes it really complicated for us as, as we try and engage, engage at a really deep level. Uh, I think being young has been really hard. Uh, <laughs> uh, I joke, uh, half joke, half, ser uh, half being serious when I um, tell people that those of my, my classmates and I who moved to Washington, D.C. to keep growing the organization, for those of us who could, we grew beards so we'd look older. Um, and because people just think we're just going to be, uh, someone will ask us a question and we'll be on our, on our iPhones all the time, as was mentioned yesterday, and, and, and lose attention. So I think, um, especially in D.C., where most people gain more power through seniority, and usually the people who have been in Congress in DC the longest tend to have the most power. Uh, and so coming as a young person, you're at the bottom of the totem pole. And so we've tried to find ways, especially you know, the millennial generation, we, we have the energy and the ideas, but we don't really have the access uh, or the power yet. And so especially with genocide, people think we're naive and they're like, oh, that's so cute. Uh, you'll never do it or, or get back to us. And so 
older generations tend to dismiss and don't engage. So we have to find innovative ways to do something. So another example of how we overcame something was a sen Senator Luger at the time was chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, and he wasn't putting a bill on the committee to then get to the floor to then get to the president's desk. And so we weren't, young people are rarely campaign contributors, so we're not donors. And for those of us outside of Indiana, he doesn't care because that's what he needs for every reelection. So we knew we needed voters and donors. So what we did was we went on a website called opensecrets.org, and it lists all significant campaign contributions. And then we used whitepages.com to call his top 200 donors and say, I know you gave $1,243 to Senator Luger. Uh, hang up the phone, call 1-800-GENOCIDE, tell him to put this bill on the agenda. And they're like, who are you? Who is Darfur? Why are you calling me? Uh, and then we use Google Maps to go after churches and synagogues and mosques around Indiana, telling them that as voters, they have this great leverage uh, to do some things. So uh, we just organized 100 people, and in less than two weeks, Senator Luger put the bill on the agenda, and the US Senate passed uh, the legislation. So we've had to compensate for our lack of being campaign contributors and having access uh, to leveraging those who are 35 and older to do so for us. <laughs> well, thanks very much. I think I realize we've come to the end of our time, so I'd just like to thank all of our panelists, and um, I hope perhaps we'll have a chance to chat over lunch. Thanks so much. Before you get up to leave, I just want to make a few a few closing remarks. I'll, I'll you please go ahead and proceed to <laughs> disconnect or whatever you, you need to do. Um, it, it has really been such a pleasure to have all of you here, and I just want to emphasize again how uh, how much it meant to have uh, so many members of the Rockefeller family with us uh, for this. It really has made the whole thing so much more meaningful for everybody. Um, I think uh, yesterday we got a, uh, we, I hope you were inspired and, and fascinated by the very remarkable story of the Rockefeller family. Um, the combination of innovation and imagination and drawing on expertise and, and of course, at the core values uh, that have been transmitted generation to generation are, I mean, again, it's, a, it's just a, such a unique and remarkable story um, and has had such a, a huge impact um, on, on this country and on the world for that matter. So, uh, and then hearing about Winthrop Rockefeller and his, his particular brand of uh, leadership and philanthropy and the heart and caring uh, that underlay everything that he he did and, and which completely transformed uh, this state and his legacy lives on as you heard you know we're hearing today I mean it's 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 that that philanthropy is not done and over with it's 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 still working and it's still it's still transforming lives as you saw as you saw in the tape and so I think that's a uh, that's important um, it's I think there there are reasons for even though the problems we've talked about are absolutely on a scale unprecedented in the history of of mankind the population growth driving uh, at the being the primary driver uh, but uh, the scale of the scale of the challenges that we face is enormous and yet there's, I think, tremendous reason for hope. And uh, you saw some of that on the stage uh, just now, just examples of the, uh, the tremendous amount of, uh, of creativity and energy and dedication to, uh, to finding ways to solve problems, both big and small, uh, is, is remarkable. There is, as uh, David Bornstein said, more talent uh, than we've ever had on this planet. And if we can harness it, if we can find ways of really, of really um, helping to empower and facilitate um, the the use of that those talents to to take on some of these challenges uh, take on all of these challenges for that matter we need that um, the, we, the world has the potential to be a much uh, a much better place um, and um, I also was pleased that David a New Yorker uh, <laughs> and I was only until recently a New Yorker I commented on the quality of this audience and the obvious caring and warmth um, of, of all of you and uh, and so uh, 
it, this conference wouldn't have been the same without without each of you in the audience and uh, and what you've what you've brought to it. And I hope that we'll again continue the lunch over conversation. Can you continue the conversation over lunch, and um, and um, and get to know each other better? Uh, the last thing I'll say is that it takes a village to do something like this, to put on a conference like this. And so I just want to thank and recognize um, all of my um, all of my colleagues here at the Institute that have been so instrumental. I mean, virtually everybody was involved in one way or another, and they're mostly not in this room right now. But I want you to know that that from top to bottom, all, all throughout all parts of, uh, of this organization, everybody was contributing to making this work. Um, and I want to particularly thank, of course, our programming and marketing staff. Uh, that really did the, you know, or the core team putting it together, uh, Kathleen Curry, uh, Ashley Snellenberger, um, uh, Jessica Kelly, uh, Angie York, uh, Peyton Christenberry, um, and uh, Jerry Stoltz was also an important, important part of it. So anyway, uh, please join me in giving them a round of applause if you would. Okay, and so let's move on to the tent and have a, have a lunch together. <laughs>